Spend time with the Voices of Watch Collecting, a blog to watch's team broaches the most important topics in timepiece enthusiasm today. This is the Spending Time Show. Hey everyone, Ariel Adams here with David Bread, and this is another episode of Spending Time. Hey David. Hey Ariel. Hey everyone. So we uh, we just lived through Watches and Wonders Digital 2020, and we have a lot of coverage of brand new watches uh, from this digital event, which is supposed to be a real event that we were supposed to be at, and we're all depressed about that. Um, it's just been so long since we've seen watches. But That's the Blog to Watch team has covered an awful lot of news, and David and I want to talk about um, each of our top three watches uh, for Watches and Wonders, and just sort of generally discuss um, some of the launches. So we're going to add a lot of commentary as we go into this, and we're going to um, stagger um, our picks right now. These are in no particular order, but these are the watches that we thought, thought were really cool. I will begin with the Mont Blanc 1858 Automatic 24H watch. That stands for 24-hour watch. This is a single-handed watch by Mont Blanc. It's not something they've mm -hmm. ever done before. Um, but Meister Singer, which I guess if you're just not really <laughs> that familiar with, you know, watch names, I guess someone could get Meister Singer and Mont Blanc, you know, mixed up once in a while. So I don't know. <laughs> and <laughs> it's not the normal Mont Blanc logo. Actually, this is the what they call the Mont Blanc 1858 logo, which I'm not that big of a fan of. I prefer the normal corporate logo. So I'm saying all the negative things first. I'll talk about why I actually like this. Um, mm -hmm. Also, this collection, the, the Mont Blanc 1858 collection, which is, is still kind of a newer collection. It's very retro inspired. It's actually like meant to celebrate mountain climbing, mm. which has absolutely nothing to do with the historic German writing instrument maker. I'm sure there was plenty of Mont Blanc pens that went up mountains, but in sort of their desire to diversify as a marketing entity and have different arms, they created this new arm it's all about celebrating mountain climbing because I think that sounds like a, a good business thing. Like, oh, Mont Blanc, mountain climbing. That's weird. You know what I mean? Like, like someone in a, in a boardroom thought that sounded great. Like, oh, my God, we're, our, the name of our brand is White Mountain and mountain climbing. That's metaphorical, right? Like people are mountain climbers and they're climbing in the business world. So let's have a collection to celebrate mountain climbing. Oh. Like, you know what I mean? Like it seems. This like is it really far fetched. <laughs> no, but this is the look. We, you know, this is the way they talk, they think. Okay, let's be yes. honest. <laughs> it's it's desk diving and now it's desk climbing. I desk guess. climbing, yes, climbing okay. the corporate or actual mountain. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the watch, the watch is nice because it really looks like a vintage instrument. The case is forty two mm -hmm. millimeter wide in steel with a bronze uh, bezel. Great looking crown. watch, by the way. Yeah, and, and what I also like about it is, you know, single-hand watches have to be worn to be understood because they create sort of a what I call the pie chart of the day. And <laughs> you live through the day differently because you're like, oh, the day's half over or like there's only a quarter yes. left of the day. And it, it's just a very different way of appreciating how time flows throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that what Mont Blanc did here is they actually made the dial different than the way it would normally be because usually 24 is at the top and now 24 is at the bottom. Yes. So if even if you've worn other single-handed watches before, given the different orientation, this is going to wear in a slightly different fashion. It just makes so much sense. I think it looks great this way. I mean, this, this yeah. is the way it makes sense. I mean, why would you want to add like 24 up top? I mean, that sounds logical at first, but once you see it this way, you realize, no, this is, this is right. This is the correct way of doing it. All I'm saying is you know that other brands have done it another way. So this makes it yes. – I, I don't know this is the first time this has ever been done like this. Also, there's two different types of 24-hour dials. I talked about one recently that look as a traditional two-hand watch, but rather than 12 hours, it's 24 hours. Those, to me, are a little bit difficult to visualize. But this one is different because it represents the full cycle of a day in a, mm -hmm. in a sort of very simple way. So in, in a lot of ways – this is a watch that is not just poetic, but allows you to actually visualize the day differently. And finally, if you have line of sight with the sun, you can go ahead and use this hand in, co in combination with the scale on the, the inner bezel there to, yeah. to know the, the compass direction, which again, the, I don't know. You'll use it once in a while. 
Yeah, for the record, I mean, you can use any analog watch to do that with or without um, um, a compass bezel or flange. Sure, or but whatever. this would remind you that you should do yeah. it in a while. It's cool. It has this adventure kind of flair to it, and that's great. And just to explain to our listeners who don't see the watch, so the way it works right now is that the 24 hour, is, 24 hour mark is at where 6 o'clock used to be, and 12 o'clock is where 12 o'clock normally is, so up top of the dial. So your day actually starts down at six o'clock, which is just great. And then it yeah. goes in double digits, it's two, four, six, eight, and so on. Um, the smallest increment that you have in between the hours are 15 minute marks. So you're not going to be to the minute accurate with this watch, not even close. But yeah. that's, you know, that's just the way it works uh, because you just have one big orange hand and then it just passes through basically 15 minute increments. Well, you know, I think that's okay because we yeah. do live in a time where we have accurate digital clocks everywhere. Yeah. Right. So I, I guess you're right. If you were like going on a mission to the jungle, would you want to take this watch? No, that'd be a terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, but if you are in a situation where you're just sort of an urban traveler, which most of us are, this is, this is sort of a, a poetic and convenient, convenient. It's fun. It adds something that your phone doesn't do. It's still a watch and there's a bracelet option. Let's not forget that. They just mentioned that very quietly, but there's a bracelet option. I don't oh, know what really? it's gonna I don't know what it's gonna look like. Yeah, they just said there's a bracelet option. So this starts at just over three grand, which again it's a Mont Blanc, so <clears throat> not their starting price point, but you know, Mont Blanc releases these fancy tourbillons that are like, you know, over a hundred thousand. So a three thousand dollar Mont Blanc that's this exclusive, it's actually not that bad. Yeah, that's true. And and our commenters are are highlighting a bit of a controversy um, in, in the article, which I, which I find hilarious in a way. Um, not, that, <laughs> not that they are doing it, but the fact that it actually happened is that uh, so the dial has uh, the map of the Northern Hemisphere printed on it. And uh, some eagle-eyed um, commenters from England have spotted that Ireland is on the map and uh -huh. even the Faroe Islands are on the map, but England is not and Scotland is not. It's just... It's just flat out missing and it's actually <laughs> almost in the center right above the 24 hour mark and it's just a blatant like absence of, of england all of it to and be fair yeah that's a cross section where these lines would go through so no. someone may have made the an artistic decision <laughs> <I don't, laughs> it's just so weird it's, it's, the it's a little weird it's a little weird once you see it you can't unsee it there's just no way to unsee it it's yeah, just, it's just absolutely. Hilarious. But here's the thing: these are, you know, there's gonna be so many comments here. I don't. Maybe these these haven't even all been produced yet. Like, yeah, Mont Blanc might be like, uh oh, how do we? Because you know, <laughs> they never showed anyone in England before they came out with this, right? No one oh, actually. This is the first time anyone's seeing this, and I <laughs> <laughs> look. You know what? With ups and downs, this watch is one of the the, the more interesting and original releases. It obviously mm -hmm. has a lot to talk about. And here's the thing. Just the fact that it has a missing country on it will mean that when you're in a room with a bunch of watch nerds, you'll have more to talk about. It's a proper Brexit watch. There you go. It's the, prop, the, the, Brexit, the Mont Blanc Brexit, as we will call it. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, moving Love on. It. Now one of your choices, David. Yeah. Um, um, it's going to be IWC for sure. The new Portuguese collection has been updated and expanded greatly. Uh, I, I flew to February uh, in February to London back when still was legal to do so, and uh, and yeah, and I saw all these hands on. And the one that I that really really got me was the uh, Tourbillon retrograde chronograph. It's just such a great looking watch, very proportionate, very legible. Um, I just I just love basically everything about it, except for the price, which is which is which is going to be high, of course. But how much is, is this watch? Is up there i mean it's available in steel which is a good start because we because i just wrote about the vacheron constantin the traditional mm -hmm. tourbillon chronograph which is also a chronograph in a tourbillon slightly different complications yeah. wait no they both have power reserves right or no no yours is retrograde date yes retrograde date okay yes. so the vacheron is like one hundred and ninety-seven thousand dollars. or something okay like that. iwc is close i mean it's unbelievable it's like it's over a hundred grand and I mean, but the, the, the other version is, is 123 grand. It's way I, too much. There's these IWC tourbillons are interesting, but I know that they've always depreciated highly because I don't know that IWC is the brand that people want tourbillons from. 
Do you, do you feel that way? You know, they make a nice tourbillon. Just from a branding perspective, I'm not sure if it's, it mm-hmm. makes sense. I, I see what you mean. I think a tourbillon makes sense for IWC, but not a hundred grand. It would make sense for 40. You know, this feels and looks, to be fair, like a 40, tops 50 grand watch because it has um, a movement we all know with the retrograde date, with a, with a sub-dial that has the hours and the minutes for the chronograph. And it basically just has a tourbillon added to it. It's not the end of the world to add a tourbillon. Those states are gone when people believe that the tourbillon is just super hard to do. It's not. Well, um, here, think of it this way. No, you're probably yeah. right. And I agree with you. And I always think tourbillon prices should go down anyways. But remember that IWC has been a company that was making tourbillons for a while. And they were really expensive. So they always face this problem with, with existing clients. How do you go down so much? And then justify your your previous um, prices. That's one of the, the the political issues these brands always have is because uh-huh. they sell to the same people for years. If I you spent a hundred thousand on a Turbion four years ago, and now you spent yeah. forty, that yeah, means that it automatically means that your hundred thousand dollar Turbion isn't worth nearly as much as you thought it was. That's true. That's true. Um, yeah, I can I can I can see why that is. Uh, you know, to protect the investment of. of customers okay that's fair that's fair so enough. let me ask you a question because you were talking about this versus another iwc which was at the yeah. completely other end of the spectrum in terms of affordability exactly. my yes. question because you've seen these i haven't that's so sad i'm really regretting does it feel really high end because i know that richemont when they do sometimes entry level uh-huh. they, like, they really go out of their way to make sure that you know it's entry level you know what i mean like you and, didn't pay top dollar for this right yes so and you should you should be <laughs> reminded of that every time you look you at know, your watch. You know what I mean, right? I know what you mean. I know what you mean. And unfortunately, that's not the case here. I was really impressed by the IWC Portuguese or Automatic 40. Great looking watch. Uh, you know, just when so the first impression I always remember of watches, you know, when it's just down there on a tray and you walk up there and you see all these different versions and you pick it up for the first time. And most of the time, first impressions are right and they prove to be right you know once you take a closer look and you look at your macro photography and all that and you hear from the brand what it is and this was a very positive first impression i'm not trying to justify the first impression i'm just saying it made a good impression and then uh, the more you uh, look into it it just it just continues to prove itself it's still seven grand so it's not cheap at all but it has an in-house made movement so it's the 82,000 series um movement with the uh, peloton binding and ceramic and the big chunky rotor and all that so it's a great looking movement looks good in 40 millimeters too it has it's it's just a handsome watch there are four different versions of it available three with white dials and one with blue dial i'm, I'm taking it the white dial with the blue hands and hour markers was your favorite yes. yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right yeah it's it's very legible very straightforward it's it's one of the few remaining IWC watches that that make me feel like it's an engineer's watch. For whatever reason, I always looked at IWC and it was really like pilots and engineers' watches and all that. But it once was because go, of the engineer. Mm, yes, probably <laughs> because they had a, a watch called the engineer. That's right. But but even so, like just from my personal encounters over the years of of, of just you know uh, people wearing IWCs, who who were they? And most of the time, they were like architects or whatever. But these sort of people, and I've said this a bunch of times before, they like a legible watch. And once you become illegible, which a quarter of these four watches is, <laughs> one out of four, they, they just turn away. So now these are very legible, great looking watches, very handsome, and not in your face size anymore. They are 40 with a subdial seconds at six. Just a great looking timeless watch. I think they're going to sell truckloads of these. Yeah, it looks pretty nice. Uh, question are these flame blued and is there a bracelet? No word. I, I don't, I, I've, I've, none of these has been on the bracelet, but they are on these, you know, great looking um, leather straps from IWC. These are not Santone. I think, I think they don't put Santone straps on, on the seven grand watches, but they are very similar in quality and, and nice looking folding uh, buckles and all that. They look um, nice. Is that, is that an alligator strap? Or is I it think just they are. Print? Okay. No, no, no. Definitely not print. No, no. They are proper straps. As far as you, I know. You no, can't no sell those about... in California now. You know that? Yeah, I know. That's that's interesting, actually. I'm going to be crazy. smuggling a whole lot of alligator. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <Sounds great>. <laughs> <laughs> At least you're not getting the word out there. That's good. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, I don't think anything is, 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 uh, is flame blue here, actually. It's just a regular Richmond thing with like shiny hands over a shiny blue dial. It's just not going to be legible. But the white dial with the blue in the season hands, great looking watch. Okay, so now I'm going to choose a tourbillon as well, but a completely okay. different kind of tourbillon. And this is actually a watch that I've wanted to like over the years, and finally they made one that I, that I really do. This mm -hmm. is the Laurent Ferrier Grand Sport Tourbillon. Right. And this is the sport version of the very first Laurent Ferrier watch ever. And a lot of people may not know this. I was the first one to ever write about Laurent Ferrier. I, I saw him at a watch show in Geneva. He was just really? walking around. Yeah, he was just walking around. And I was like, what is that? And I took some pictures of it. And, I, and it was amazing because it was this double spiral tourbillon uh -huh. movement. And the tourbillon movement was uh, only visible on the rear of the watch through the case yes. back. It wasn't mm -hmm. something that was so like obnoxiously shown as some of them are, you know, on the dial. And this isn't unique. This is how, you know, like the first, you know, Patek tourbillons were. It wasn't something mm -hmm. you'd see. There's like a little word that just said tourbillon. And you're a like, tiny, okay. Tiny word. <laughs> yeah, tiny word that said tourbillon. <laughs> so here's a here's a beautiful tourbillon movement, which is just for the wear. I guess if you know that it's tourbillon, then that's fine. And it was beautiful and elegant. The original ones, the double spiral tourbillons, were still my favorite Laurent Ferrier's uh, to date. Yeah. Uh, the galet. Yeah, the galet. Now he's got the same movement. I believe it's the same movement or similar movement mm -hmm. uh, in a sport watch that they already debuted, but without a bracelet on the strap. I was like, okay, guys, what's the point? It's got a stupid strap. Now they finally <laughs> released the bracelet, and you have – Essentially, if you want to call it that, the Laurent Ferrier version of the Nautilus or whatever. Yes. So it's got a distinctive shape. It's uh -huh. curvy. Um, I, I don't know that in 30 years from now, people are going to look at this and be like, wow, what a design masterpiece. But it's got, it's got enough going on that it's fun. It's masculine. It's hip. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't take itself too, too seriously. It's, it's cliche in a lot of ways. Like There's so much cliche in this watch, but I think in a satisfying way. And... You know, at the funny thing is again going back to the price, it's 172,000 Swiss francs, so it's about 200,000 mm dollars. -hmm. So it does less than these other watches we're talking about, and it's in steel, so it's super expensive. They're making 12 of them in this color, so it's again, I, I don't know that the pricing makes a lot of sense, but it is beautifully, you know, the movement's beautiful. So it's one of those things if you have the money and you are into buying a tourbillon. This is one that definitely says you're successful and you have disposable income, but this is mm -hmm. very low on the, the douchebag radar. Extremely, <laughs> really, really That's down good. There. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So no diamonds, no, no solid gold bracelet or whatever, nothing. Because here's the thing. It's like, do you, I would rather spend that kind of money on a brand new steel watch than some like vintage steel watch. I would never mm -hmm. spend that kind of money in a vintage steel watch. Like, I never, just, ever. Yeah, that's right. I just looked up my review of the Galate Classic Tourbillon Double Spiral that I had. I actually had that for a week over SIHH back in I remember that. Everybody wanted <laughs> to see it. Yeah, that was, that was, you know, kudos to Lauren Ferry for lending me a um, supposedly fragile gold watch to knock around SIHH all week. And, of course, I took good care of it, but, uh, you know, it, it never missed a beat. Um, and that was 208000 So this, with the same movement on a steel bracelet with, that's new, basically, and a new case and all that, 172000 Swiss francs. That's like $108,000, something like that. So, yeah, big, yeah, that's a 30 grand price drop right there. And sure, the gold is normally more expensive, but once you're talking 180 grand, <laughs> you can you can build a 41 millimeter uh, gold case into that price easy. So yeah, it's not over to 200k anymore. Okay, so heads up for the 12 bankers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's your next pick? Um, my next pick is going to be um, a Vacheron Constantin. Le cabin, cabinotier, grand complication, split seconds, chronograph, tempo watch. What's up with and all these tourbillons we keep choosing? Yeah, it's, it's like it's, three in a row now. If if this didn't have a tourbillon, I would still I still would have chosen it because uh, you have to explain this watch to me first, and and then I could just and then we'll, okay, we'll talk about okay. styling. One person said to Vacheron Constantin, hey, could you make me something original and unique that you haven't made before? And maybe this person has some ideas or maybe they didn't have any. Okay. And 
then they made this watch, but I think they probably gave them a little bit of a price discount because in exchange for making it, they got to publicize it, right? Because you obviously spend more if the whole world can't hear about it. Because if the entire company has to like make something from scratch, essentially, and then they can't even like use it for publicity purposes, yeah. there's going to be premium involved with that, right? So mm-hmm. obviously, we don't know who bought this, but Vacheron's essentially plugging a watch that's already been sold that you can't buy just mm-hmm. to say hey, if you want some crazy thing like this, you can come to us as well. Um, mm-hmm. This watch has like, what is it, 24 complications or something? It's double-sided. Um, it's cool as hell, but it's not, it's not what I would call pretty or elegant. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it look, Neither of those things. It's not even trying to be that decorative. Like it's, it, it, does, it does sort of look like a Vacheron. It's 50 millimeters wide, okay? So they didn't oh even try... God. They didn't even try to hide the fact that it was actually a pocket watch. So you remember the watch before this? I don't remember what it was. It was the reference, blah, blah, blah. And Vacheron, <laughs> this was like four or five years ago. Vacheron Constantin, it was one SHH, and they marketed the hell out of it. I saw billboards in yeah. Hong Kong for this product. And I, yeah. I remember asking myself, no one can even buy this thing. Why do you have a billboard? And then I realized that – Halo. This, this, well, not just that, but the service – is something that Vacheron mm-hmm. wants to advertise for because do you know what these things cost? Let's just just guess. I, I don't know for millions. sure, but let's easy ex- several millions, well over a million minimum, a million dollars. So oh, minimum, I think more. I think I wouldn't be surprised if it was like two point five three million dollars. Probably because, and the, yeah. because to develop a, a movement, what these brands are telling us, and not just one, but this is the the figure that I've heard and anywhere I've went. Uh, all the engineers and, and CEOs told me to develop a movement, it costs about a million Swiss francs per year. So movement, five years in development, that's at least five million just to, just to develop it. Yeah, no, and, you know, and, and, they, and, they, and they're not in a rush at all. They are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's for sure. So that's a given. This movement has like almost 1,200 parts. Mm-hmm. And it's basically a sandwich. So what they do is they have all these modules and sections and each sections for a different set of complications. And they just stack them on top of one another. That's the only way these things can be constructed. It's this sort of 1,163 individual parts and 24 complications. Yeah. Um, I actually think the, the dial, which is the least attractive, <laughs> is the most useful. And that has mm-hmm. the four subdials. Mm-hmm. So you can see that one subdial is for reading the time, mm-hmm. and then another one's for the chronograph, and then the main dial is for the for the seconds for the split second chronograph, and then the bottom two dials are for the perpetual calendar. I just thought that was kind of interesting. It's the most two thousand and six looking watch I've seen since two thousand and six. <laughs> that maybe so explain to people that maybe don't remember two thousand six very well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's funny if you if you if you dig really deep into the block to watch youtube archives you will find a bunch of watches uh that are that have the same vibe it's way too large way too complicated basically unwearable extremely expensive to make extremely expensive to purchase don't really look that refined or or, or pleasing i mean it depends you know what you find pleasing but this four sub dial architecture in the front it looks unbelievably weird to me it, it looks like those jacob and co's with the five sub dials you know it's it's that's what it reminds me of i i don't think that this is this is the, the be all and end all of of, of good taste in watch design you know, it's yeah uh, it, it, it's not even supposed to be that i mean it for me it feels a lot so more weird. like an instrument so yeah you know what i mean it, it's logical mm-hmm. It's actually, in a sense, reading it makes sense. It doesn't take that, that – it's not that difficult to learn. So sometimes I find that these dials, they That's look fair. interesting for Good sort point. of like artistic, poetic purposes. For here, uh-huh. it's just like look – at, look at the sunrise, sunset. I'm not sure that you can make it more simple than that in an analog fashion. Oh, the case back is, is much better. I, I, the case back is great. Um, uh, the dial with these four sub-dials is not, is not my favorite, but you're right. The case back looks you know, much nicer with the, with the – uh, with the not retrograde but uh you know with the, the phase of the moon and uh, yeah and all that i think and the power reserve is very elegant as well 
So yeah, overall, it's it's an interesting exercise um, for this kind of. If I guess it makes someone happy. That's great, um, and it's also great that Washroom can keep their uh, engineers and watchmakers working in le cabin cabinotier because that's their service that that they call this. Yeah, and they have some strange connection to because this thing also has a minute repeater. Just because, honestly, mm -hmm. I mean, just yeah. because. There's Throw no it in there. And uh, then they somehow tried to connect this watch to their relationship with Abbey Road Studios, which is the, the famous recording studios. I have no idea what Dasheron's relationship with um, this organization is or when it started or what it mm -hmm. means or how it all this Probably watch is connected to it. Probably it's important for the buyer. I think it's, it's just for the buyer, not for, not for Washeron. What does that mean, though? I, like, I, think, I think the, per, the, the person who, who commissioned this piece has some sort of a connection, emotional or otherwise. Um, okay, but that. there's no actual, again, it's like, I just feel that sometimes brands just say, they're like, we want to pay lip service to this partner or something like that. And mm -hmm. it's just like, just do some, don't forget that it needs to have a connection to the product. Like, I don't like it when they have a marketing relationship just because. Like, if there isn't a relationship with the product, why even bring it up? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Anyway, it's a celebration of watchmaking because it's a split second chronograph, turbine, minute repeater with sunrise, sunset, and all the rest of it, which is just, you know, the movement is amazing. Um, I wish brands more often would find ways of exhibiting these movements because once you see this picture with, with the dial and everything else removed and you just see the parts of the split second chronograph and all that, it's wonderful. It's amazing. Well, wouldn't a watch like this look amazing with a sapphire crystal case? That's, that's really the solution. Yeah. And just, just keep it simple. Like, for example, the Rotropon, the, you know, the split second. Who would really care if you could only measure a minute with it? You could ditch one of the subdials straight away. Why do you need a perpetual? If the perpetual exists in like eight grand watches, it's no longer, you know, this amazing, mythical, super hard to do complication anymore. It's just not. So you can ditch those as well. So you could really realistically have a two-hand dial that's basically see-through or, th or four-hand, you know, with like hours, minutes, and a split second, you know, the two hands for that. And you could see the movement. I would much rather that. But then again, I don't have two and a half million dollars laying around to commission Washington. Again, you can, <laughs> you can submit your vote for David Braden as the <laughs> upcoming CEO of, uh, what was it? It was, it was Jager. Jager. Yeah. <laughs> so these are, some of his these are some of his campaign promises in this platform. Yes. So just when More the, the time for movements. I don't think the watch brand CEOs should be appointed anymore. I think they should be voted in. I really believe that's yes. it. it makes no other four year time. terms. It takes six years to make a watch. You don't want to be there at least eight years. Come on, David. Eight years. I do. I, I will be reelected <laughs> when I you know this is here's here's my campaign. If I'm chosen the CEO of Jajir, I will <laughs> promise to make at least one of every single one of those twelve hundred movements they say they have made over the years. You're four, you're freaking out, you feel trapped, you're like, Oh my god, what do I do? <laughs> they're not making any of my ideas. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. All uh, right. Uh, unfortunately, there is no Jager on this list, which is why voting yeah, for yeah. David Bren exactly. is, uh, you know, <laughs> important. Okay, <laughs> um, my last watch that I'm really excited to see, I'm excited to see all these, is the new Cartier Pasha. Uh, there's a 41 millimeter wide version for men. So that is the men's version. Um, mm -hmm. It really kind of irritates me that anything that's not men's is unisex. I love how now in the watch mm. world we have men's and unisex. Mm -hmm. And once in a while, if they just can't get away with calling it unisex, you have a ladies' watch. <laughs> once in a rare, in a rare while, and you know why that is is kind of fascinating. Still to this day, and this is why there should be absolutely no consistency in watch brand marketing. It should be different everywhere. A watch that in the United States and Europe is thoroughly considered a women's watch, yeah, is actually a uh, sell sells you know to a lot of male customers in, uh, in parts of Asia. Uh, mm -hmm. Hong Kong, for example, is a market where you see this. It's just completely just a cultural difference. But um, yeah. these brands are afraid of categorizing these watches as women's watches in one place and for another place to look at and be like, what, what's going on here? But anyways. Uh, yeah, uh, it's a globalized world. I mean, it's not easy to do that. It's just funny that they have to like insist. It's anyway, so 41 millimeters wide by mm -hmm. uh, 10 millimeters thick. This is the return of the Pasha. It's got an mm -hmm. in-house movement now, just a, uh, their, their in-house 1847 uh, MC automatic. Nothing mm -hmm. fancy there. Um, the Pasha is a round cased Cartier that has a, a little covering over the crown. So you sort of unscrew it 
It's got, looks like a little chain there. It's sort of inspired by these very old diver's watches uh, that would have, that would, you do, you would sort of screw a cap over the crown for, for water resistance. And Cartier watches are all inspired by functional things. So that's really where the posh is. Also, if you turn this on its side, uh, some people say this is inspired by a, uh, a canteen, like a water canteen. So that's kind of interesting as well to think of it because it's round like a canteen and it's got the little top like a canteen. So the Pasha, um, I guess maybe also canteen. I don't know what Pasha, uh, the name actually comes from. Pasha you don't? Is the, really? Where does Pasha come from? It, it's, 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 it's the fact that um, Louis Cartier made the first Cartier Pasha in 1930 something, 32, I believe, for the what Sultan is, of Marrakesh. And so what does Pasha mean? Um, Pasha is relate. Pasha means it's it's basically a rank um, in that region of the world. I'm I'm not gonna say like it's just the Turkish or whatever, but okay, it's a rank. A, a, a Pasha is is somebody is a high ranking individual basically. A Magyar warrior such as yourself would know that for sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> I should. Uh, um, so what Cartier does, which is quite interesting, is they discontinue popular collections for a number of years, wait for people to get excited about it and then bring it back. It's just like a strategy. So they've done that with the Panther and the Santos, uh, the mm -hmm. Roadsters one, which is now, you know, currently gone. Um, you know what? I, I think I feel like it's not that they discontinue them. They bleed them out. Um, that's, that's somehow I, I look at, look at it like, like the, the Santos, for example, that's, that was this huge, big, chunky watch again, way 2006, uh, quite literally. <laughs> And it just dragged on for so freaking long, and then boom, there it is. But I, I don't really feel like it's. Sometimes I'm, I'm not sure if I, if I consider this to be like a very strategic thing. It's, it's more like a long overdue update, as, as far as I'm. No, no, but they, they literally stopped making it for a long time. So mm -hmm. the Santos, I believe, they still made at least a lot of them for women. They yes, they did. All versions, yes. but Cartier specifically does have a strategy of discontinuing things, even if they can sell more. Yeah. So one one thing it allows them to sell out of unsold inventory on the market, which is very uh -huh. smart. Uh -huh. um, and then it allows people to ask for it and be like, "Oh, when's it coming back? When's it coming back?" So I don't Next like I, like imagine, for example, if Rolex just stopped making the Submariner for like five years. Oh my God! The whole world would come to an end. <laughs> okay, it, that's some people would say that's true. A lot of people would feel that way, <laughs> but. What would it do for for Submariner demand? All the unsold ones would be sold, you know, or all the used ones. Yeah. And people will be asking for it and anticipating it. And then when they, re when they came out with it again, it'd be a whole run. And at the yeah. same time, Rolex gets to say, we, we changed this, we updated this. Now, Rolex, you know, basically does that, but doesn't discontinue them. Cartier, you know, they, don't, they sell a bunch of things. Watches is just one of the categories. So they have a reason to sort of discontinue stuff. Not everything they discontinue, like the tank. There's always some version of the tank or several versions Good. of the tank there or, the should be. or something like that. But the Pasha was discontinued. Yes. And, you know, they, they made all kinds of versions of the, of the Pasha. Bracelet, mm -hmm. no bracelet, chronograph, all kinds of stuff. Oh, the yeah. Pasha. And now they just come back with a modern generation one that has, it has some updates to it. It's not exactly the same as the old one, though it's obviously a Pasha. Yeah. And I think the Cartier is really underrated by sort of watch collectors. Um, it's, it's got some of the same prejudices against it as like a fashion house, oddly enough. It's so weird. Um, you know, if, I, I was just going to suggest, you know, if you, if you go to Chrono24 or eBay and you start looking around for Cartier Pasha, there are some absolutely amazing Cartier Pasha watches from the last, I don't know, couple of decades, basically. Um, some really handsome looking, you know, fascinating watches. I just found a gold chrono for, I don't know, five grand, six grand, something like that. But it was like a, an amazing watch that if they debuted it now, it would be like 25 grand or, or 19 grand or something like that. So there are so many of these amazing designs. And to look at Cartier as a fashion brand or whatever, it's just so dumb to me. You know, when you, when you start to, you know, just dedicate like one minute of looking at one of these iconic Cartier watches, like the tank or whatever. They are so damn right, these watches, um, and so timeless. I, it, I would be hard-pressed to find another brand that has this many iconic and fascinating-looking watches that are specific to it and not just a diverse watch that they call iconic or whatever.
Cartier is in the top three easy, I think. I agree. And I think that it's just a matter of introducing them to the audience uh, more and more. So the mm-hmm. Cartier Pasha 41 is something I'm really excited to check out. What was the price on it, actually? So the price for the Pasha... Um, we didn't get those prices yet? No, because one, what, o- the only thing that they said is that availability starts in September and October of 2020. Depending oh, on the month. there's a little space there for initials, and there's a quick release yes. bracelet as well. Uh huh. Oh, it's, oh, there's all diamond versions. Look at that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So yeah, it, look, uh, it's pro- the men's version in steel. It's going to be about seven grand, probably maybe. Yeah. Seven, maybe eight. Exactly. Something exactly. like it's not that. Going to be the end of the world. No. It's for for me something is lacking in this wide dial steel bracelet, Pasha. It's just. Maybe, maybe in a medal, I'm, I'm going to change my mind. For, for now, yeah, I'll reserve judgment until I see it in a the medal. They're a bit safe. And, and Poshas were always a, a little bit wonky, but in a good way. You know, it's, this is just a little bit too tame for me. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, see, we'll see what it looks like. Again, it's not the most exciting watch collector's watch, but if you want an attractive and distinctive daily watch that isn't boring, mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. is a really great option. Okay, um... So I did my three watches. You still have one more? I think I do. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, it would have to be something from Panerai, I think. I'm, I'm really, you know, I'm not sure if I... Panerai or Piaget. I really like this Piaget that they... Okay, I'm going to choose the, the, the Panerai and because the Piaget is just such an extremely rare exercise. And, and Panerai finally did what I was expecting Panerai to do for all these years. And they launched a bunch of exciting new materials in, in the uh, Luminor uh, Marina 44 and not 47. All these recent years at SIHH, I was always, uh, in a way, uh, you know, just bothered by the fact that uh, David released, oh, BMG tech and all these crazy materials in the big, chunky 47 millimeter cases. And I'm like, I can't wear these. I, they, don't, they look ridiculous on me. And I guess many other people. And the 44 Luminor is, I think, that the best looking and best wearing Panerai. And to see this many, it's like five different new um, watches with, with crazy new materials from Panerai this year. That's just great. There's the 70 years of Luminor. Um, and then there are two other, these are three models, I believe. And then there are two others uh, that are the FibraTech and the DMLS. And FibraTech I like quite a lot. It's PAM 1663 is the reference number if you guys want to look it up. FibraTech, and- what is that exactly? FiberTech is basically, and the reason why I chose it is because it has this vibe to it, like NTPT carbon a little bit. So it's just a bunch of different layers uh, over one another. And uh, it reminded me of a Richard Mille watches that are like 300 grand or something like that and, and have these multi-layered materials. Um, let, let me check because they, they gave this convoluted... Uh, I'm looking here. It's I'm nice, sure. but the thing is this. I'm looking at all the new Panerai watches and they're yeah. attractive. The one with the lumen is great, but I'm, I'm missing a sense of novelty. You know, there's definitely mm-hmm. a lot of line extensions in the watches and wonder watches. We mentioned a lot of the brand new watches with Panerai. I always feel like it's tr- this blend. Like they try to make something new, but everything ends up feeling like a line extension. It is, but is that necessarily wrong? I mean, I'm not sure. I just want, I want to see a little bit more novelty. You remember it was a year mm-hmm. ago or two years ago where they had, it was new hands essentially and mm-hmm, maybe a little mm-hmm. bit of the new hour markers and it was like, yeah. oh my gosh. And it felt, it felt like a revolution. I'm not saying mm-hmm. I need that all the time, but you know, Panerai, for example, is doing this. They don't, they're no longer interested in trying to convince the $5,000 watch guy that their watches are worth ten to $20,000. What mm-hmm. they're trying to do is convince the thirty to thirty thousand dollar and up watch guy that they should go down to this level and wear it for fun. I don't know that that makes like I don't quite understand it. I'm not saying it doesn't make mm-hmm. sense. It's just it's what is the value proposition? Because they got a great look. The yeah. brand has interesting heritage. Mm-hmm. Um, they make a lot of really great things. Mm-hmm. I just if you're someone at that level who is wanting to have a daily sports watch what is it that you're looking for you know what i mean because it it is a question of having someone who's basically wearing like an all gold watch or a tourbillon or some type of complicated thing going down into this 
And wouldn't that person just sort of lust for like a long gay, you know, Odysseus or something? If you, if you look at it that way, sure. I mean, they wouldn't, you know, probably reach this down if they, if they expected like high end finishing and whatnot. But to answer your question, I think what people are looking for is an iconic design. Oh, you're a Panera guy. Oh, you like, oh, this is Italian design, blah, blah, blah. It looks, and it, okay, it looks great. It's a very stylish watch. It's one of the few Swiss brands where I can say, okay, it's a stylish looking watch. Um, and you get the luxury pricing, uh, you know, going with it. You could get an Anonimo or a Jean Richard or whatever for the fraction of a price with, this, with essentially the same or very comparable styled case. But somehow Panera just gets everything right in the Luminor 44 size. As far as the cases are concerned, Dyer's not so much. And crystals definitely, you know, with the hor- horrendous reflective crystals, it's terrible. But um, the way it wears and the way it looks and the message that you're sending is that, oh, I like Italian design. I have a bunch of money to spend on a single watch. And now Panerai is trying to justify its, its pricing with its genuinely, you know, nicely made and, and uh, um, uh, feature heavy uh, in-house movement. So for me, you know, it's not that painful to see a Panerai watch for like eight grand or 12 grand. These Fibrotech watches are like 16 grand, which is like you say, it's, it's way too much. I mean, for that kind of money, you, you know, you're going to get something I, else. What I'd like to see is the core Luminor case, but yeah. in fancier finishing. You know, let's get some mm-hmm. anglage going on there. Let's get some hand finishing. It's not that they've never done stuff like that before. I'm just saying they seem to be taking a few cues. First is mm-hmm. the traditional Panerai. Then they take cues from like... Um, Richard Mille with some of these, you know, materials and things like that. Then they try to get a little bit, you know, fresh with the colors, which I appreciate. I think the watch is trying to be too many things at once. Yes. Once. And I'm not saying it's forgetting it's a Panerai, but they want it. It's like the watch designer and the marketing Mm -hmm. person that talked about price and the movement maker. It's like they never chatted with one another. I want to be, I, here's what I, that's a good point. Here's that I, I so want to know. I, I desperately want to know. Who was the guy or girl who said, who put their hands up and said, guys, this is great. It has to have a vignette dial in blue. Who, whoever says that? Like when everyone is doing it, you know, Moser started it back like, I don't know, five, six years ago. A bunch of vintage, vintage brands did it in the 70s and, and, and 80s. So it's not like a new thing. And then like you say, this is exactly right. This watch wants to be so many things, and it already is. And then someone says, "Oh, slap a vignette dial on it." It just looks so dumb. It's it's unbelievable. We got it's about nice we got about one more minute here, so let's <sighs> let's wrap everything up. Um, yes. those have been our watches again. We chose a Mont Blanc, a Panerai, a Vacheron Constantine, a Laurent mm-hmm. Ferrier, uh, and a Cartier. Um, yeah. There's a lot of new watches and wonders watches. We haven't even finished covering all of them yet, and there's going to be more watches coming. Go to a blog to watch.com right now and start checking those out. You sort of scroll back in time, you'll be able to find them. But we also have an article that has them all together for you in one place, all of the new uh, watches for 2020. So you can find all that stuff in the blog to watch.com and check all these things out. These have been our favorites of Watches and Wonders 2020. This has mm-hmm. been Spending Time. Good talking to you. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And the title of that article actually is Watches and Wonders 2020. See all the newest releases right here. And that has links to some 30-odd articles on all the novelties. And we'll talk to you next time. Thank you, Dave. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.